I'm wearing a mask. So, as usual, we're a few seconds late, and I ask the few people here, or the also fewer than it was people on Zoom, if anyone has questions or remarks about last time or any other time. Otherwise, I'll just continue. So, let me remind you very briefly uh, what our aim is in the, this uh, section of the course, which is going to be three lectures, last time, Monday, this time, and next Monday. And uh, what I do on Wednesday, I don't know. It depends how much of my notes on the, this very solid convergence series I can find. So I don't make any promises. But for these three times, we were studying the problem going back to Hardy and Ramanujan in their famous paper on partitions of 1918. They mentioned, or they actually discussed in some detail, more than I'd originally realized, the problem of uh, power partitions, the so square, or more generally, power, let's say S to power partitions. So P S of n, for n, of, no, well, both S and n are natural numbers, is the number of partitions, which means splitting up as a sum without regard to the order, partitions of n into s the powers of natural numbers. So what that means is that if you define the generating function with the product m from 1 1 over 1 minus q to the power not m is for Hardy and Ramanujan, or rather for Euler, but uh, m to the s, which is what they also wrote, that defines the function capital equal colon, and then we expand that as a power series, q, and call the coefficient of q to the n p s of n. So that's, that was the problem. And so there are two parts. But actually, the two parts became three parts. So part one, which was really last Monday, already done, is discover the all orders. So discover the asymptotics So first, the asymptotics of PS of, let's say, root of unity, e to the minus x, first to all orders, to all powers of x in x, as x goes to 0. So here, z is any root of unity, not just 1. And guess. So that you can do, so this is not discover, actually. This is find, but I did do it numerically, but you can do that by Euler McLaurin, as I'll explain today. Discover that and guess an exact formula. So this will be an exact formula describing the behavior of PS near root of unity. Then part two, which is today, fairly clear, you have to prove it. So I'll indicate the proof of the exact formula, how we first do the approximate form. The last time I only showed the numerical methods and said very briefly that you can use Euler McLaurin. I want to give more details on that. And then part three, which will be next Monday, uh, apply it. Well, apply to get the coefficients. So apply the famous circle method of Hardy and Ramanujan. So remember. I mentioned what that is long ago in the first lecture. In the second lecture, uh, you can take, for instance, q is a constant where r is less than 1, or you could take some other contour which circles around 0 once. It doesn't have to be a, an exact circle of radius r less than 1. And then you just take ps of q, uh, q to the minus n, well, q to the minus n minus 1 dq. OK, so by Cauchy's formula, that is, of course, the formula for PS of n. And then the idea is, as you, if you go around the circle, which is as radius very near 1, 
then you'll come near all of the roots of unity, and there's a contribution from each one. I will not attempt, and I, I mean, not because I don't want to give it to you, but because I, I don't know how to do it. I have not attempted to do anything like an exact analysis of the famous major and minor arcs of Hardy, Ramanujan, Littlewood, Bina Prabhup, and so on. I mean, that's, I don't, I don't even know if it can be done. It's probably a very non-trivial uh, problem, maybe at the level of a PhD thesis. It's certainly not something I think anybody could do in an afternoon or two. Okay, so, but anyway, I haven't done it. So this will be, what I'll do is find the exact contribution to all orders of each root of unity and add them up and see how far we get. But that's for next time. So today I'm not talking about the coefficients and therefore not talking about partitions. In, I'm simply talking about this function and of course uh, also its logarithm, which is the sum. So, so first let me remind you from last time that just as in the case when s is 1, if s is 1, of course, then p1 of q, which is the generating function that Euler found of partitions, which is the product 1 over 1 minus q to the n, the nice way to write this is q to the 1 24th divided by a to of tau, where a to of tau is, I'm not going to write it again, anyway, I'll write a to s in a second, and q as always is e of tau, e underlined of tau, which as always means e to the 2 pi i tau, and q to the lambda, even if lambda is not integral, doesn't mean you take the complex power, uh, you take the complex number q to some random lambda power, but that you take e of lambda times tau, you take that particular lambda power. So if s is arbitrary, we do the same, we'll write p s of q, well I've already written p s of q, but let a to s of tau in general be e to the minus half times zeta of minus s times tau. So if you want q to the minus a half zeta of minus s. So if s is one, zeta of minus one is minus 12, and so minus a half of zeta of minus one is plus a 24th, which is just what it should be. So this is, well, I can remind you, it's one over 24, product one minus q to the n. And this part, of course, is p1 of q inverse. So here, in the same way, we take p s of q. Well, I can write it out. p s of q inverse, which will therefore be the sum 1 minus q to the n to the s. Now, one amusing thing that will happen, I actually think I, I gave the result yes, last time. Uh, I mean, I gave a formula that would imply it, but I think I didn't mention. The function 8 of tau is extremely small as you approach any root of unity. And the reason is it's a modular form. And so every root of unity corresponds to tau tending to a rational number. Every rational number can be moved to infinity. Infinity, the function is exponentially small. Therefore, ps of tau, which is essentially 1 over 8, is exponentially big at every root of unity. And the size, the speed with which it grows, is something at q equals 1, roughly the square root of that at q is minus 1, roughly the cube root of that if q tends to a third root of unity, etc. But here, it's completely different. Uh, the behavior at each root of unity is different. And so already we did it last time, and I'll write it down in a minute. I did the experimental things when s was 2, the next case. And kappa was a, was a number with denominator 5, a over 5. And zeta was e to the 2 pi i kappa, so a non-trivial fifth root of unity. Then what happens in that case, and I'll give the formulas again, I'll remind, I gave them last time. If I take the five fifth roots of unity, so this is e of a fifth, e of two fifths, and then of course three fifths and four fifths, then here, eta uh, uh, p, p2 is exponentially big, if I remember correctly, and here it's exponentially small. But maybe I got them reversed, I'll look it up in a second. But the point is, uh, and at other uh, roots of unity, maybe they're both big or both small, but with completely different orders of growth. And not only, so not only the different S roots of, uh, C roots of unity for a fixed C, so A over C where A is prime to C, range is mod C, not only they have different orders from each other, but they also have orders that you have no idea how to compare with the previous one. In the hardy Brahmanujan situation, as I said, Q equals one gives some exponential term, and therefore some exponential term at the end in P of, in P of N which is e to pi squared of 2n over 3. There's something exponentially big in squared of n. 
But then minus one gives something e to the one half of the same exponent. There's half as many digits. And the two cube roots of unity both give a third. And all of the 11th roots of unity give an 11th. So at each stage for each c, you add up all the contributions of that denominator. They're all of the same order of magnitude. They're all big. But here, some of them are big. Some are actually, when the function is small, the contribution is actually zero to the order that we're interested in. So some don't contribute anything. But even the ones that do contribute, some contribute something huge and something very small. And they don't come in the natural order. What does happen is that c equals 1, q equals 1, is always the main term. But for instance, uh, q equals 4, I think, for s equals 2 is more important than uh, c equals 4. So i and minus i turn out to give bigger contributions than the two predecessors, minus 1 and the q root, q root of unity. That we'll see next time. But uh, th the effect on the pn, on the little p, s of n. But the effect on big p, we'll see already today that the growth is not at all of the same order, and it's not even always big. So the function a to s can be big, even though it's in the classical case of the cusp form, it's exponentially small near every root of unity in q or near every rational point in tau. Here it can be very big, which means that p s can be very small, and you get no contribution. So that's, so now let me recall what we did last time. So we always had this normalization. And it was only partially justified last time. Today, when I write down more explicit formulas, we will see that it helps a little. But even last time, I said that for the final formula, to see that exactly this a of minus s is the right thing to simplify the formula, you have to do some work with the function equation of the Riemann zeta function. So don't worry about it too much. It's just a, a, a harmless constant. But if you don't put in that constant, the formulas would be even worse. So what we had was, of course, in the case of the dedicant eta function, we had eta of minus 1 over tau is the square root of tau over i, eta of tau. But then I told you that this would be common. This is, well, I think I called it a theorem last time. Eta s of minus 1 over tau will be 2 pi. So these are two of the results or the main two results I told last time. Eta s of minus 1 over tau will turn out to be exactly, this is not asymptotic, but an equality even though there's no modularity. It's exactly 2 pi to the s minus 1 over uh, 2 times square root of tau over i before s was 1. So we didn't see this factor. And then it's the product. But now it's not the same formula, because the s becomes 1 over s. Of course, when s was 1, that was the same formula. And also, it's not just minus 1 over tau and tau. Here, z is indeed a point of the upper half plane, but it's not tau. It's an s root of either tau or minus tau. So in the case when s is 1, this says z is either tau or minus tau. But since tau is in the upper half plane, and z is in the upper half plane, it can't be minus tau, so it's plus tau. And so there's only one term. This gives the modularity. But in general, we'll have exactly 2s. So this is the same. What I wrote here is the same as z to the 2s is tau squared. But it's uglier to write it that way. So you see there are exactly 2s zeros, but exactly half of them or in the upper half plane, exactly half of them lower. So this is a product of, uh, so there are s factors contributing. So it's not a modularity because, first of all, the function doesn't relate to itself at a different point, which a modular function does. Instead, a to s of tau relates to a to 1 over s of z, where z and, well, minus 1 over tau are related in some way. And secondly, it's not one value on the right, but, but several. So you can't go back. You cannot write a to 1 half of some unknown z in terms of a to 2, because you'd have to combine it with its, its, all of its partners. So the, it's not at all a symmetrical relation. It's not at all a group action like here. And there's nothing like modularity. So the, the modular group does not behave uh, nicely on a to s as a function. So that was one thing that I explained a little how one did it numerically. Uh, first at 0, and then for other s. But then I explained a much more complicated example, which was an s was 2, and a was an integer, but only modulo 5, and prime to 5. So you could take a to be 1, 2, 3, or 4, or more intelligently, plus or minus 1, or plus or minus 2. It's actually even. And so it doesn't, there are only two cases. And then I went into, I explained how you can numerically Study at this. So this is a fifth root of unity, non-trivial fifth root of unity. 
And here, x is going to 0. Let's say it's a real number. And going from above, you can also come at an angle. And remember that for the numerics, it was actually quite important to come in not just to 0 horizontally. So here's x. Uh, x, and we're going to 0. But sometimes we wanted to come in on, on some line in order to separate the various eigenvalues numerically. But the final result, which was first uh, found by a lot of work, we're getting 300 terms to the asymptotic. Well, first, the asymptotic expansion was easy to all powers in x. That part was easy. But then, when you subtracted that, you got a second term, which was again easy. It was the second expansion. And the third, and in this case, it was only after I had 300 of those terms numerically, which took uh, many hundreds of digits of precision and several days of work, that I could recognize the rule. And the rule was, in fact, quite complicated. So I'll write it out again, as I did last time, slightly differently from last time, but very, very slightly. So there are five terms. The, the, the first is a constant, square root of 5 over 2 pi. The second is the power of x, which is x to the 1 half. I'm only doing s is 2. OK, so we have a constant. We have the square root of x. Then the big term is the exponential times c a over 5. Uh, c a over 5. Sorry, a over 5, it should be. And later, this will be c 2 comma a over 5. And this number I don't have in my notes. I have to go back and look at the notes from last time. Uh, and I want to maybe. So last time I gave the formula for this c. So c a of 5 was the square root of pi over 2 times the square root of 5. So square root of pi over 20, if you want, times 1 fifth times the read and minus eta function at 3 halves plus a over 5 times the value of the L series. Uh, uh, at a over 5. And of course, the L series is positive. This is positive. So if a is positive, so if it's 1 over 5, I mean, if a is a quadratic residue, so a over 5 is positive, then this is positive. But when you compute the numbers, I maybe even have them written down. I certainly have them in my computer to 100 digits. I don't actually see where it's written down, so I won't bother. It's an even function, so there are only two values. But c plus or minus 2 fifths is actually negative. It is the opposite sign, because the L series. Uh, if the L series is not bigger than, say, it, it can't be, because the, it's the sum with coefficient plus or minus 1. But there's a 1 fifth here. And so this is bigger than 1 fifth of that. And so when you have a minus sign, it becomes negative. And so the result is that, therefore, here, that's just what I wrote here, that here, p2 is exponentially big, as I wrote. Here, of course, p2 is very exponentially big. Uh, that's clear. But here, it's, it's much smaller because you have this factor. But that factor is less than 1, but it's still positive. But here, it's exponentially small because it's the exponential of something negative. So that was kind of a surprise that even the nature of the, uh, of the growth, whether it's growing or, or shrinking, even that changed. And then there were two terms which were, uh, well, I can put them just to save time. I'll put it as the sum. It's the same term twice. It's z, uh, g a of 8 pi cubed i to the plus or minus 1. So it's either i or minus i divided by, and now if I could only read my handwriting, I'd be happy. I think it's 100, and I'm sure it's 125x. So there are two, two correction terms, and those are the ones that were a, a huge sum of exponentials that it took a lot of work to find. And so g a of x is a pure sum of some coefficient. That was the part that was relatively easy to recognize. Remember, as long as we tried to look at p itself, it was very hard to recognize because it was a mixture of different exponentials. But once you took the log, then these terms were in the form of pure exponentials with square root of m times i, that this 8 pi cubed, et cetera, times square root of i, or square root of minus i. That was relatively easy to see. But the coefficient is something of a mess. And so here's what the coefficient is. This coefficient is 1 plus or minus the square root of 5 over 2, so either the Goldman ratio or its 
algebraic conjugate times the sum d squared divides m of 1 over d if the m is congruent to plus or minus a mod 5. Remember, a is either plus or minus 1 or plus or minus 2 mod 5. So if m is also not 0 mod 5 and is the same the genre symbol as a, that's the contribution that you get. Okay? If m is also not 0 mod 5 but has the opposite the genre symbol. So A is a quadratic residue and M not, or vice versa. M is congruent to A, plus or minus 2A multiplied by 5. Then you get 0 as the contribution. And finally, if M is 0 mod 5, then what you get, if, I mean, I'm reading this from my notes, and I hope I didn't make, uh, I mean, I even slightly transcribed the form, but I think it's correct. You take the sum, D squared divides M, and then it's 1 over D. And so that's just like it is here times 1, except that this 1 plus or minus square root of 5 proves to become minus 1, which is kind of good because it means the sum of all these five numbers will be 0. If I take this part, this would have a minus 1, two zeros, and a 1 plus square root of 5 over 2, 1 minus square root of 5 over 2 add up to 1. The whole thing adds up to 0. So that part, uh, so I, I think I've got the signs right. But then you have another Legendre symbol which is a times m over d squared over 5 divided by 5. So if I write it like that, I didn't write it quite like that last time, then you see that since m is 0 mod 5, if d is prime to 5, which it might be, then, uh, then this thing is, is prime to 5. m over d squared is an integer, but if m is 0 mod 5 and d does not have a 5, then this will be 0 and it won't contribute uh, this term. But in order for this to contribute, since m is 0 mod 5, m over d squared has to be non-0 mod 5, so d has to be divisible by 5, and therefore, m has to be divisible by 5 squared. So this, is only, uh, this only occurs if 25 divides m, and that's why when we wrote it out, they said the formula was kind of a mess because it was one thing if m was prime to 5, but actually not one thing, but four different things, depending on whether m was 1, 2, 3, or 4 multiplied by 5. And then to make things worse, if m was 0 mod 5, there was a term which was just the same except a different coefficient in front, but a new term which only happened at all if m was 0 mod 25. And that's why the things, you know, when you write it like that, it looks halfway reasonable. When you're trying to do it experimentally, it's impossible to figure anything out. Now, if you take this thing and then take the last part and put in the sum, you know, q, q to the m, and sum, you can write it in terms of a log. And that's what I did last time. But the way I wrote it now, I think, is a little little better. OK, so those are, those are the things that we found last time experimentally. And now the idea is that we want to prove, uh, you know, to, to show why these things are true. I won't certainly give every detail, because it'd be, there's a lot of calculation, and it's, it's not very interesting and would take too long. But I'll, give, I'll try to give all of the main ideas. So let me start with the case that's well known. Because that when we understand everything, and then we can see exactly what we have to do, and then we can do some of it for every s. So if s is 0, I'm going to actually m number a couple of formulas so that I can refer to them. First of all, it's modular. So remember 8, it's probably still written here. 8 of tau is q to the 124th product, 1 minus q to the n. It's a modular form, and that means that for any element gamma is A, B, C, D. In SL2Z, we have an equation, A of A tau plus B over C tau plus D, is a 12th root of unity, which I'll write as E, remember, E to the 2 pi i, times an integer depending on gamma over 24. This thing is an integer, uh, times C tau plus D to the 1 half, and then you have to make some conventions for which square root you take. But if, it's a, if I don't tell you what n is, then of course if you take the other, you have to make a fixed convention, which is the same in the whole upper half plane, where c tau plus d is never zero. So once you've chosen at one point, it's a constant. And then there's an n, and if you take the other choice, you have to change that n by 12. I'm not going to write down every formula anyway, so it doesn't matter. Now let's write that if I define the appropriate a logarithm. So I'm going to take a logarithm of a of tau, but that's not actually correct. 
The logarithm of eight of tau, the logarithm of a non-zero complex number is not well defined. It is infinitely many changed by two pi. The only function that's well defined is log of z, which is the one that I think everybody knows if you start with the log which is positive, uh, real, on the positive axis, and then you extend to the complement of the negative axis, and if it makes you happy, you can do something on the negative axis, taking the argument of your number to be either i pi or minus i pi, we won't need that. So log is the principal branch, and that's a well-defined function, but of course it's not continuous, let alone analytic. As you cross the line, it jumps by two pi i. However, here, uh, so this is going to be some log, some log, but that's not well defined of eight of tau. As I move eight, if I go sufficiently close to the real axis, uh, this, this formula will not be, it's not going to be the standard branch, it's a particular branch. So it is a log, its exponential will be eta. And of course, it's clear what I have to do. Here I take the log of one minus q to the m, but since q is in the unit this, so is q to the m. And so one minus q to the m is always in the circle of radius one around one, so it's always to the right half plane. There's no problem. So we, we have the standard branch, and so we have a way to choose. And now if you take uh, the st statement that we actually want, of course, so let me call that one, is it's the same as, as the first, but at the level of the log, then we get the same integer over 24 plus the log, sorry, times two pi i, undoubtedly, pi i over 12 if you want, and then a capital log of c tau plus d. Now I can make a choice plus h of tau. And so if, you know, if I've made some reasonable choice, people actually take the log of minus c tau plus d squared to make sure. I, I don't want to worry about details here. So this is what we know because it's modular. Of course, that's exactly what we can't use in uh, later. But now I want t to tend to a rational number. And the rational number I can always write as a over c, but I'm not going to actually. I'm going to write this minus d over c, where c will always be positive, and d will be a number modulus c squared, or actually, let's say it's it's just prime to, it's an integer prime to c because it's not exactly periodic at period one. It might be period 24. So I'm going to let k, uh, I'm, I'm not sure if this is capital. Let me just say that I let capital, I think it won't be in a second. I just let it tend to minus d over c. So how will I do that? Sorry? There certainly could be and should be. Thank you very much. Yeah. There certainly should be a half. I mean, I also didn't tell you which log. That's not important, but that is important. Thanks a lot. OK. Uh, it's written wrong in my notes, too, so at least I'm reading correctly, but not much of an excuse. So I'm going to tend to a point that I call minus pi over c, and I'm going to write the number as minus d over c, and then plus, it has to be in the upper half plane, i over x over c, where x is going to go to infinity. Okay, so then tau will go to minus d over c, and gamma of tau, which is the same as it was, a tau plus b over c tau plus d, will now be uh, on the nose equal to a plus i x over c. But I'm not, well, of course, it doesn't matter if x is going to infinity. No, what I'm doing for the moment is exact. So now I, I suddenly can't remember whether this x, because I kept changing x and 1 over x, if you're supposed to think of it as big or small. No, this x is supposed to be small, actually. Because in the end, I want to be tending to a over c, which will be my kappa, plus actually I'm going to have x going to 0. So let's not even worry about tau 10 to minus d over c. This is just a statement. If, if I make a change of variables, and I write any tau, having fixed my gamma, as minus d plus i over x over c, then gamma of tau is a plus i times x, rather than x inverse, over the same c. So if I do that, then this equation becomes, this is exactly the same. It's now a plus i x over c. But now I want to write it slightly differently. So first, there's this same pi i over 12 that we already had, times a plus i x over c. But now, Uh, something has happened with the log now. There must be a log of x somewhere. C tau plus d 
not able to do this. D tau plus D is I over X, so there's going to be a log of, uh, of I over X. I'm not going to worry too much, maybe half. Don't worry about that. I'm interested. The interesting part, but I have, I have lost a term, sorry, copying. And now what you get is, of course, the sum of the logs of this thing at the corresponding point on the other side. But that point will have a see-through of unity. Sorry, no, but I'm right. I'm, I'm completely wrong. There is no. I'm not applying yet the functional equation. That will come later. I'm just multiplying it out. I'm letting x is going to 0, so tau is tending to a number kappa. And the other part is that I'll write that kappa as a tau plus b some other tau here. So if I take this, then this is just the definition. h of something is pi i tau over 12 plus the sum. So I'm not doing anything. So I'm just taking this. But now q to the m will be e to the 2 pi m times this thing. And that's very close to e to the 2 pi i m times a over c. But that will then depend on m mod c. So what I get is minus the sum l mod a of a function that I'll define in one second of a over c, sorry, l over c, comma, a l over c, and 2 pi i x. This is not from the multivariate. This is just from the definition, from the original definition of h. But I'm breaking up the sum according to m will be congruent to some number l modulo a. And so I have to tell you what l is. So l of alpha, beta, and a variable t. And I should tell you where these are. These are real numbers, but modulo z. I mean, here they're rational, but in principle, they could be real. They could even be complex, but so that would be a choice of roots. Anyway, they will be real, so why bother? And t will be a positive real number, or it could be uh, the, a real part of t is positive, I think, would be good enough. Everything I do, or certainly if it's near the real axis, positive real axis. So L of alpha beta t is now going to be the minus the sum. So this is the important definition. Alpha beta are two numbers multiple one. I take the sum over all numbers which are in the congruent class z plus alpha, so that indeed only depends on alpha z, but positive. We did exactly the same with Euler McLaurin. I'll re remind you in a minute how Euler McLaurin shifted, Euler McLaurin looked. And then it's 1 minus e to the 2 pi i, and in the application would be a l over c. So beta would be a l over c. And then here, it's e to the minus mu t. So, so that's the, the basic, uh, the first step, is you split it up into little pieces. You know, exactly c pieces, where c is the denominator of the rational number you're approaching. OK. But now, uh, now we use Euler-Maclaurin, so shifted Euler-Maclaurin, which I talked about in earlier and even proved in an earlier course, uh, lecture of, the, of this course. So remember how it went. If f is some nice function, let's say it's smooth at 0 and small at infinity, then the sum, so f is more or less arbitrary. This is f of t, and this is t. Then the sum f of nu t, originally it was nu as a positive integer, but more generally, it could be shifted. This was shifted on McLaurin. Alpha is again in z mod, uh, r mod z, or q mod z, it doesn't matter. And I take only the positive numbers. So if alpha is 0 mod z, this is some of positive integers. Otherwise, it's shifted. And what you got to all orders was i f of t, where i f is simply the integral, f of x dx. And then the other terms were, well, there are two ways of writing them. Uh, one is you put the Horvitz zeta function, but already put it with the Bernoulli function. B r plus 1 bar of alpha. Remember, alpha is only multiple 1. This is the periodic Bernoulli number, which I'll remind you in a second what it is. And then you take the original Fourier expansion of f at 0, so f r of 0 over r factorial, and you multiply by minus B r plus 1 of alpha over r plus 1 factorial, which is the value of Horvitz zeta function at minus r. And then here it's t to the r. And that's to all orders.
And so Br plus 1 of, well, Bn bar of x is Bn of the fractional part of x, so I make it periodic. Unless n is 1, remember, if n is 1, it's a sawtooth function, and then at the jumping point, you take the middle. And this Bn of x, in all cases, is n minus 1 factorial over 2 pi i to the n times, since it's periodic, it better has a Fourier expansion, some e of mx, and the constant term is 0 if n is positive, so it's m different from 0, and the denominator of m to the n, actually, 2 pi i m to the n. OK, so this is the uh, euler maclaurin summation formula. So now we can use that. And so if I do that, then this thing here will be, by euler maclaurin 1 over t times the integral. That's an exercise. I won't do it. It's the dialogarithm. Remember, li2 of x is the sum x to the n over n squared if x is less than or equal to 1. Then it converts. If x is bigger, there's an issue of analytic continuation. Uh, but we don't care here, because this will be e of beta, or e of minus beta. I forget. This is e of beta. So remember, beta is also multiple 1. So the constant term, of course, doesn't care about alpha ever, because that only is the integral of f. I mean, here, my f I didn't say. f of t in this example will, of course, be minus log of 1 minus e of beta. So beta is fixed, e to the minus t. And then I'm summing, replacing t by nu t. So this thing only depends on e of beta. And if you just expand the log as sum 1 over k, e of beta k, e to the minus t k, you get this formula trivially. So it's that uh, plus this sum r from 0 to infinity, b r plus 1 bar of minus alpha multiple mistakes. Maybe it was minus b4 over r plus 1. It probably was, because it was the, anyway, I really don't care. And I'm not going to get every formula right anyway. So you have an entire expansion, and the coefficients here of t to the r involve the periodic Bernoulli number, as they have to, according to this general euler maclaurin summation form, which, as I say, probably there's a minus alpha. I'd have to look. I mean, it's almost the same. It's a question of a sign. Uh, I'm not sure if it's right or wrong. But it's that. But then there's still a part that depends on beta, and that's the negative index Li. So Li, uh, I can put Lij of x is this over n to the j. So Li1 of x is just the function that we've been using, minus log of 1 minus x. So this is simply Li1 of e to the 2 pi beta e to the minus t. But Li0 of x is. Uh, it's just a geometric series, and it's x over 1 minus x. And similarly, li minus 1 of x is x over 1 minus x squared. They're just polynomials. So uh, this is basically just a trigonometric function. It's a rational function of e to the 2 pi beta, as, long as, as soon as r is strictly bigger than 1, uh, even equal to 1. Uh, even equal to 1, yeah. So only the term r equals 0 involves a log. OK, so that's that. But now, the, I mean, so far this has been straightforward. It's just what you'd expect. But now comes the key point. That is the reason that it's going to work for eta. But you would think it only works for eta because eta is multiple, but it's going to work for every s. So th that's the nice surprise. But first, I'll do it for the case we know. The asymptotic series uh, for L alpha beta of t so alpha and beta are fixed numbers multiple 1, and t is going to 0, it is infinite, and it's factorially divergent. So there are infinitely many non-zero terms, and they blow up and never converges. And the reason is kind of clear from this. This thing grows. Uh, this one also grows like r factorial. This grows like r factorial. We're dividing by only one r factorial. It's not enough. Believe me, it blows up like r factorial. So it's no good. But, but the asymptotic series, the disymmetrized function, so let's call this L sim of alpha, beta, and t, which by definition is the sum of what it was before. 
plus. So it's really, it's actually twice the symmetrization. I mean, it's the, well, it's the symmetrization. It's twice the even part. So if you change the sign to both alpha and beta, and you add L of alpha beta t and L of minus alpha minus beta t, then when you do this, what you use is that uh, uh, bk bar of minus alpha picks up a sign minus 1 to the k, bk bar of alpha. But uh, li uh, k of 1 over x, after analytic continuation, picks up a sign minus 1 to the k minus 1 times li k of x. You have to do analytic continuation outside of the circle except on the negative cup. And so because of that, in this product, uh, now something has gone wrong because now it looks like it's that they're the same symmetry. So I must have shifted something by 1. I have the feeling it must be 1 minus r. Where this term would be r is minus 1. So 1 minus r is 2. That's very good. I actually don't see what's wrong, but these formulas also look right. So Li1 is the log. Well, of course, that isn't true for k equals 1. But for k at least 2, Li2 is essentially an log function under inversion. So it looks like the, oh, sorry, that's right. r plus 1 and 1 minus r have the same parity uh, because of the 2. I got confused. They have the opposite. They both have the opposite parity of r. So I have two k's with the same parity, and these two things add. So this is opposite parity. And so when I change the sign of both alpha and beta, everything cancels. And so what you get is much simpler. And modulo typing mistakes, which are certainly possible, it will be the periodic uh, version B2 bar of beta over t. Then there'll be a constant term, which is the periodic version of alpha times the periodic version of beta. So B1, B1 bar of alpha, B1 bar of beta. And then there'll be the last term, which is linear. And that will be minus B2 bar of alpha over 2 times t. But then that's plus to all orders. So that, that's the very nice thing, that what was a divergent asymptotic series now gives the sum of two divergent series. But every term, except the, the linear term, the constant term, and the 1 over t term cancel, and you're left with the terminating asymptotic series. So now you have something uh, exact. And uh, in fact, uh, so now if you put this formula back into this one, then the important point, otherwise it wouldn't have helped us to know that, it, that the uh, symmetrized function was so nice. But of course here for free, I can put, well, symmetric, so the symmetric should be the even parts, so I'd have to divide by two. Because when I have L, I can replace L by minus L, then I change both signs. So they always come in pairs alpha beta and minus alpha minus beta. And therefore, the whole thing uh, symmetrizes. And if you put that in, what you'll get, I mean, it's a, the exercise takes a few minutes, will be, remember the C tau plus D was log 1 over x. The log 1 over x is some extra term that we had somewhere. I can't trace it all through. But anyway, when you now plug it in, you get exactly the function equation of the eta function, but only as an asymptotic series to all terms. But it actually lifts. But in fact, if you think about it, we've got much more. Because the eta function, and I've actually never seen this proof, I think, of the transformation of the eta function in this form. If you look at eta very near a root of unity, then the product 1 minus q to the n to high order, q to the n will be very nearly zeta to the n. And so it'll depend on n mod zeta. So it factors into a lot of things. And we're taking the product of all of them. But what I've said now is if you take the product where n is OK, 0 mod c, let's forget that, but n congruent plus or minus l mod c. Then I'm saying that the smaller products, let's say I'm zeroing on the fifth root of unity, but I take l congruent to 2 mod 5, and l congruent to minus 2 mod 5, I have to symmetrize. Then those two together will also give a terminating series. And that, if you know your multiple forms at all, you'll recognize immediately the product n congruent to plus or minus 2 mod 5, let's say. And also 0. So you always have to include 0 and plus or minus 2. That's the famous Jacobi triple product. And that's some theta series. So some Jacobi theta. 
And then by the transformation equation, because it's a Jacobi form, it's some other theta, and I'll just put one over x, dot, dot, dot. So roughly, you invert the argument. And so indeed, you get something much stronger from, from this argument asymptotically, but afterwards exactly. It's not just that the whole eta function has a nice form, but, but near a see-through of unity, it's a product of roughly c over two terms, which are the, over every pair, ln minus l modulo c, ignoring zero. And each of those separately has a terminating series. You get something very nice. And that will happen. It's not so important to us, but it will happen exactly like that for a to s. So now I do the same for a to s. And probably I shouldn't even erase what I said, because a lot of it's very similar. So the modularity course we don't have, h s of tau we already had. Remember that so this pi i over 12 will become minus eight of minus s over two times uh, two pi i tau. So I guess it's minus pi i is eight of minus s tau. And this will be the same with m to the s. So that was the definition of the eta function. Eta was just the exponential of this, e to the minus pi i is eight of minus s tau times the product one minus q. And here, this is m to the s, not m times s. OK. So this is the log, some log, but a, a well-defined log, what I called a to s. And so now we can do exactly the same thing here. Uh, maybe I, it's hopeless to try to, well, no, I think I can actually do it. So the pi i over 12, I think it's, it's completely fine, will become minus 2 pi i times a of minus s times a plus i x over c. And this will be l s. And the only thing that changes is that it's now a l to the s over c. So that's not the only thing that changes. Maybe I will write it again, because it's getting impossible to read at the bottom of the board. So the, the statement is that h s of a plus i x over c will be minus 2 pi i zeta of minus s times the same, that's the boring part, x over c minus the sum L modulo C, I won't put the mod each time, L sub S of L over C comma A to the A L to the S over C. And then the argument is slightly, uh, you know, in, in the, this is just all keeping track of notations, completely boring, but when you do it, it's this. OK, so it's this and Ls of alpha, beta, and t is now uh, minus the sum mu in z plus alpha, and again, positive, of log. It's exactly the same as before. The only difference here is, of course, that here we have e to the minus ut to the s. But the t, if I want that to be t, I have to put this stupid 2 pi to the c to the s minus 1 times x to the power 1 over s. Otherwise, it doesn't come out quite right. OK, so it's the same story. And so this, again, gives uh, some divergent asymptotics by shifted euler maclaurin It's a complete exercise to do. And then this gives an exact uh, uh, terminating. So this gives me terminating asymptotics. Actually, will turn out to be exact. Terminating asymptotics for, and now the important thing is the definition of Ls symmetrized of alpha, beta, and t. But now it's clear what you have to do. It's not quite the same as before. You take the value at alpha, beta, and t. That would correspond to some L in our infinite product. But now, we have L over C. L goes to minus L. This becomes minus L. But if S is even, that one doesn't change. So therefore, the alpha is always minus alpha. But the beta either changes or doesn't change, depending whether S is even or odd. So the symmetrization is slightly different. And that will mean that all the later formulas are slightly different when S is even and S is odd. And so this, again, gives terminating asymptotics, and it, which actually turned out than to be exact. So what you get, finally, as an asymptotic 
series, I'll just answer, give the whole, argue, the whole answer because I've given essentially all the steps of the calculation with Euler McLaurin that it takes, you know, certainly several hours to do by yourself. And even if I wrote it, you copy it, and I, you know, it's, it's, uh, it's tedious and there's absolutely nothing happening. So the, the proposition says, well, there are, it'll be easier if S is even. So I'll write it for S even, and then I'll, I'll mostly put the modifications if S is odd. So remember, alpha and beta are real numbers multiple Z. They don't have to be rational. T is going to zero. Let's say a positive real number tending to zero. Then what we'll get is that, remember, the first term is a one over T, and that's the integral. And that one is very easy to compute. And it's 2 gamma of 1 plus 1 over S times Li 1 plus, before, remember, it was Li 2. Now it's Li 1 plus 1 over S of E of beta. So that's the main term. And then there's a very simple correction term if S is even, which depends whether alpha and beta are 0 or not. Remember, it's only multiple 1. So when I say they're not 0, I mean they're non-integral. If they're both non-zero, then it's really simple. It's just 0. And that's the entire uh, expansion. But if alpha is 0, but beta isn't, then the formula is log of 1 minus e to the beta. And if alpha is not 0, but beta is 0, then it's minus s times log. Now, I don't need absolute value because it's the real part, so it's actually absolute value of 1 minus e of alpha. And if alpha equals 0 equals beta, if they're both 0, then it's s. And in this case, there's a log term, which is why in the final ex expansion, when you add everything else, there'll be one log left over. You know, somewhere in this product, you have l equals 0. And then both l over c and a l to the s over c are both 0. So you always have that term in our application. So it's not that bad. There's a very, very trivial correction term, which is a constant, or a constant plus a constant times log t. And the main term is just 1 over t times the constant. The constants depend on s, alpha, and beta. So it couldn't be simpler. If s is odd, then the answer is slightly different. It's still 2 gamma 1 plus 1 over s over t. But now it's the real part of uh, li 1 plus 1 over s of e of beta. So you have to symmetrize differently. And so you symmetrize with the uh, you know, beta and minus beta. So you get the real part. And then there are two more terms that you didn't see at all before. One of them, surprisingly, is the same as it was for the dedicant uh, zeta function. So it's a product of two periodic versions of b1 bar. Remember, b1 bar is, is, the, is the soft to the function. So it's b1 bar of alpha b1 bar of eta times t to the 0. It's a constant. That's independent of what s is. It's always the same. Okay. And then there's another term that, uh, that you don't see if s is even because it's 0. Uh, no, sorry. This is something new. It's zeta bar of s alpha. I'm not going to redefine it. In an earlier course, I said this is the Horvitz zeta function, uh, but made periodic. So the same sum u congruent is alpha mod 1 and u positive of 1 over nu to the s. And then that at a negative integer is given by the same Bernoulli number made periodically we had. So these terms are new. And then we again have four terms. This is the same, the first one, so it's 0. The third is the same. And the fourth is the same, so that part doesn't change, these three. But this one becomes, again, the real part. Uh, so it becomes the log of the absolute value of 1 minus e of beta in the second case out of the fourth. So here's the complete asymptotic expansion of this thing symmetrized. And so that's kind of a pain in the neck. But now I can finish. Oh, yeah, I've used up a lot of the time already just for the asymptotics. I wanted to get to the exact part, but I'll do that more. So the corollary of this proposition is the actual behavior of PS. And so now kappa is going to be a rational number. Kappa will be, you know, A over C. So denominator C. And then here I'll put E to the minus 1 over T to the S. So T is going to infinity. So this is something you can intend to zero. And this will be a product of several terms. And the first one 
involves a, de a generalized Dedekind sum. So this is one half. The usual Dedekind sum, which is the n that I had there, that n multiplied 24, it's a famous form due to Dedekind. It is two or three, it, it, a trivial additive term, and then a multiple of the Dedekind sum. And the Dedekind sum is defined as the sum L multiplied C of the periodic Bernoulli number, Bernoulli polynomial B1 of L over C times B1 bar of A L over C. That's the classical Dedekind sum. Now here, remember, I told you that this extra term, which was only true when S was even, but here I'm, uh, it doesn't really matter. Uh, I said that part doesn't change, alpha and beta, but the beta changes because it's L over C and it's A L to the S over C. So this is a modified, it's a generalized Dedekind sum. So that's kind of amusing. And you might say, wait a second, that term is only here if S is odd. It's not there if S is even. But it's also not here if S is even, because then uh, if S is odd, if, yeah, if S is even, then this is an even function. That's an odd function. The whole sum vanishes. So this is only non-zero if S is odd. So there's that multiplicative factor. Then with what you'd expect, which is a constant over t to the S over 2. But actually, the constant isn't just one. It's an integer, n s of c. And this is the smallest integer n, positive integer n, such that its s power is divisible by n. So when s was 1, it was just c. And if, uh, and if c is square free, then it's uh, also just, I guess, just c. But it, otherwise, if c has some higher powers, it can be a little smaller. Anyway, it's an integer. And then we'll have a purely exponential uh, number. That's the one that I wrote before when s was 2 and k was plus or minus fifth. I'll write it in a second. So that will be a term that's exponentially big. So that's the one that really counts. And then we still have this stupid 1 half zeta of minus s that you, you wouldn't see when s is 2, which is the case we care most because zeta of minus 2 is 0. But you see it for the dedicated data function. That's the to the 124th, and then we'll have again 1 plus O of t to the minus n for all n. So that's like what we found experimentally, that you get a terminating asymptotic expansion. The only thing I have to tell you is what this constant is, and that's also quite pretty. It's gamma of, well, in the case of s equals 2, it's gamma of 3 halves over c. I mean, I wrote it earlier today, last time when, k, when c was 5, L mod 5, and then it's the 1 over s e of l to the s kappa. So multiple mistakes. It, uh, none of this matters, the exact formulas, except that you see that they're complicated, they have many pieces, but that there's, it's still a finite expression. So if you only want to all orders, then you're left with something uh, finite. And this is to all orders. And the reason is because we have the terminating thing. OK, so now that's, uh, that's uh, you know, the, the thing to all orders. But now the claim, oh, I think that's the claim. I'm not sure if I'm saying something right. It's not quite that it's exact. No, I This obviously can't be exact. This is going to become a product of 1 minus something exponentially small. So we will lift this to an exact formula. That's the point. It's, I mean, it's still, even for the dedicated data function, that thing which is 1 to all orders is still a product of 1 minus some powers of q tilde, where q tilde is e to the 2 pi i of, for instance, minus 1 over tau, or gamma of tau. And that's very small, but, but I mean, so the You'll have something exponentially small in powers of it, but you'll still have it. So they'll be here exponentially small in some ex uh, explicit way to the power t to the actually 1 over s. So we have to lift this to an exact formula. So now comes the important philosophical point, I mean, the thing to take, take home with you out of this complicated calculation. I made that point in a very early lecture of this course. Uh, actually, there was a question, in fact, by, like most of the questions by Emmanuel, 
when I talked about the Euler McLaurin summation form, he said, well, couldn't you in some situations use Poisson summation? Wouldn't it be better? And the answer is yes, when you can use it, it's way better. But you can't always use it. And the point is, Euler McLaurin, remember, is the sum in the case form I did it, a function f of n, or to keep track of how things were doing asymptotic, I put f of n t with t very small. And it's a sum over half a lattice. So you can, of course, include, if, you want, if f of 0 is finite, you can include this. But the Poisson summation formula is a form that if f is a function which is small in both directions, and you take the sum f of n t or in both directions, and this one is an asymptotic formula. This is the one that we know, i over t plus something plus something times t plus something times t squared. But it's, in, in general, an in, in infinitely long form that there's no kind of, it doesn't terminate, and it's certainly not exact. Uh, you can't even sum it, because the terms are essentially always exponent, uh, factorially big, so it never converges. But this one, when you have the sum n and z for any smooth function like this, which is small at both plus, plus minus infinity, that's the sum. This is Poisson summation. It's the sum f tilde of, uh, well, 1 over t. If it's, it's really without the t. It's just f tilde of n. But when you rescale, it's uh, n over t, uh, where f tilde of s is the integral for minus infinity, infinity e to the 2 pi i st f of t dt. This is the Fourier transform. So if you think of what that looks like, if this function is very rapidly decaying, let's say it's even more than rapidly decaying, let's say that it actually is extremely rapidly decaying, then f tilde will become an analytic function in some, in some strip. It's a very nice function. It will be very, very sm And if this function is also c infinity, or even better, omega, if it's c infinity, this function will decay faster than any negative power of s at infinity. So it's very, very small. So therefore, this sum is convergent faster than any power sum. But if f is actually analytic, this thing will actually be exponentially small. And so now when I do this, the first term is f tilde of 0. But f tilde of 0 is, of course, what I called i of f before. It's simply the integral. So the main term, which is the same one we had before, well, now it's the integral, it's the integral from minus infinity to infinity. Before, it was 0 to infinity. And then, typically, it's exponentially small. But it's convergent. It's a, a sum, but it's a convergent and explicit sum of exponentially small things which are getting exponentially smaller. So it's way, way better. So it's not that it isn't this weird. After you, when you need an exact form, it becomes easier than the original asymptotic. It always becomes easier. However, you're not done. Because when you do this, if you just want the asymptotic things, you get i over t and all these other coefficients. And indeed, they will cancel when you symmetrize, as they just did. But now you only have the i f of t. You still have to compute the other terms. But the point is there is a form that it's exact and will be exponentially small. And to base it, I finished today's lecture, even if the time runs out completely, because when you do that, you will get all of the state, state, you know, everything comes out, and the things that were found experimentally at the end were on the nose turn out to be exactly that. And the reason is exactly the symmetrization. So I won't show you in a little detail how that works here. And I'll only actually carry it out in the case when s is even. Remember, there was already a case distinguished for s even and s odd. In the proposition, with most of which I think I even kept it, it was easier when s was even. There was only one main term, and then a constant, and maybe a log t. But when s was odd, there was a second constant, another constant times t to the s, and also these formulas changed a little bit. So. I mean, I just to, to save time, because anyway, the most interesting case is s equals 2. Let's, let's take the case when s is even. But now, if you remember what ls was, ls was, I hope it's still here. Yeah, here's the definition of ls. It's the sum over all mu, which are strictly positive, but congruent to alpha modulo 1, of log of this thing. But now if s is even, then if I send t to minus t, I change nothing. When I change nu to minus nu, I don't change the s power. I do, however, change alpha to minus alpha. But I don't change beta. But that's good, because remember the symmetrization, which is still written here somewhere. When s is even, you just symmetrize in alpha, alpha and minus alpha. You don't change beta. And so you see that what you have is that this one, if s is even, 
is simply the sum, and u is simply in z plus alpha, and it's either positive or it's negative, and then it will be the same thing, log of 1 minus e of beta e to the minus mu t to the s, which I can write as the sum mu in z plus alpha of some f, uh, which is an f alpha beta, I'll usually just call it f of mu t, where f is the same thing that you see here, minus capital log of 1 minus e to the 2 pi beta, e to the minus t to the s without the mu. And here it's either positive or negative, but every real number is either positive or negative, unless it happens to be zero. And so if it's zero, that will only happen if zero occurs, but zero can only occur if alpha is zero mod one, and then you'll have that contribution, but then t is just zero, so you'll get log of one minus e of beta. So this is a stupid correction term, it's just a constant. Uh, I hope I got the sign right, otherwise it's the opposite. Log, capital log of one minus e to the two pi pi beta. So, so that's the extra contribution of alpha zero. That's really a detail. But the, uh, but the important thing is that this is a sum, and this one now is convergent. If S is even. Because as mu goes to plus infinity, you have e to something exponentially small. But as, t, as t goes to, as mu goes to minus infinity, you're squaring it, it's still exponentially small. If S is one or odd, then it isn't quite, and you see that already in the original eta function, or in the Jacobi triple product, you have one minus q to the n times some x. And the triple product, you would like to say n can be, here n is positive, and so you'd like to say n could also be negative. But of course, this would, would blow up exponentially. But then you say up to an infinite constant, which we'll do a la Euler, this would be q to the minus nx times one minus q to the plus n, x inverse. And so you take out the infinite constant, which becomes something like q to the zeta of minus 1 times x to the zeta of 0, or minus x. You have to, of course, do a little fiddling to get the right Jacobi. But morally, this term, of sending n to minus n up to its trivial factor is the same as sending x to minus x. And also, if you take the derivative of the log and the derivative, it's really true. If you take the log and take the second derivative, you kill this linear term. And so then it's really true, and you can apply Poisson, but at the end, you have to integrate twice, and it's a pain in the neck. So believe me, you can do it, and it comes out, but it's considerably more work. So what I say for S even will work morally for S odd, but if S is even, uh, you can simply do Poisson directly because the sum over all mu and z plus alpha is what you want it to be. So for that reason, you're done. Now I'm simply doing much better than I thought this time. Uh, so... Okay, so if we do that, then we'll, what we'll get, when I symmetrize, so I mean, I wrote the general formula of Poisson with f tilde, and in our case, as I said, f of t for us, f of t will depend on two parameters, alpha and beta, which are real numbers modulo one, and this was minus log, capital log of one minus e to the two pi beta times e to the minus Yes. Uh, sorry, there doesn't seem to be much of an alpha in that, does there? And indeed, there shouldn't be. This is just an f beta, as far as I can see here. Ah, because I just wrote the simplest Poisson. Of course, I forgot to tell you the shifted one. If you take instead f of mu t, where mu is not all integers, but shifted integers, so without any condition u positive, then you get exactly the same thing, f tilde, but now it's e to the 2 pi i times n alpha. So you, you insert, and so if alpha was zero, it's just the sum, and otherwise, and it's the same theorem as before, if you replace f by f times, you know, f shifted, then a Fourier transform changes by that exponential. So this is the function that we're going to have. And so what you get when you do it now, I'll just do the even case, but I've, it's almost the same in the other, but I don't want to keep making case distinctions. Then you have an elementary term, so I'll use E for elementary, and epsilon, everybody knows that epsilon in mathematics is always small, so there'll be an elementary term plus a small term. So this is very small, and we'll write it down in a second, but this one is elementary. 
And it is two parts, because in the Poisson summation form, the remember one term is the one when n is zero, and that's the integral of infinity from minus infinity to infinity. That's independent of, of alpha. And then the small terms, typically. But here, remember, our function had one extra term. If alpha was zero, there was an extra term. So we're, we have that one. So this one is, I mean, I already actually more or less said it. It's 1 over t times a constant, depending on s and beta. And the constant is 2 gamma 1 plus s, li index 1 plus 1 over s of e of beta. So just in case you've forgotten what this is, this means it's the sum m from 1 to infinity, m to the power of 1 plus 1 over s. And here it's e to the 2 pi i m beta. OK, so that's the constant, except that there's this uh, slight correction term that alpha is 0. Then I have to add the capital of the principal log of 1 minus e to the beta. So that's the elementary part. And epsilon is something small. But epsilon, you can read off from this. There's a thing with an e to the 2 pi and alpha. There's a Fourier expansion, a Fourier coefficient. So for this f, I have to compute f tilde. Let's call it y. So this would be integral from minus infinity to infinity of, well, just this function that I just wrote, uh, e of ty dt. And now you integrate by parts. So basically, whenever you have an integral in life that has a log, you, you know that log, you can't deal with log, but you can deal with its derivative. But luckily, uh, a pure exponential, e to the 2 pi ty is also the derivative of the pure exponential, which is 1 over 2 pi i y times the same exponential. And so you, you pick up, then this becomes a derivative and by integration by parts. It's small at both ends. You get the same exponential times the derivative. And so uh, multiple mistakes. It's s t to the s. I could take off the s. e again of t y dy divided by e of minus beta. Oh, sorry, dt, excuse me. And here it's e to the t to the s minus 1. So this is a very, very rapidly convergent function. You can expand in various ways and get what you want. So what you get, uh, so it's value, you, you insert that, and you do this, and you interchange the sum or something. I mean, it's, uh, these are all, uh, this was an epsilon s. Epsilon s of alpha beta t, the extra bit, is the following finite expression some, suddenly. It's the sum, no, sorry, it's an infinite expression. I sum over all points in the upper half plane, if I did it right, such that they're s parts, just like what we had before. But now, before, remember, we were summing over a shifted lattice z plus alpha. But now, because of this thing, when you un unravel it, it becomes the shifted lattice uh, z plus beta. So alpha and beta change their roles. And there's also a second sum with only two terms, plus and minus. And then it's the principal log of 1 minus e of plus or minus alpha. So the, remember before, we had a 1 minus e to the beta. So beta's become alpha, and alpha's become beta. Before, we summed over lattice z plus alpha, and we had a factor of 1 minus e to the beta. And then uh, this is simply plus x over t. So this is, you know, I mean, it's a closed expression. This converges very, very rapidly, and it's a closed expression. So now, essentially, we're done. Uh, but since I still have 10 minutes, I'll give a little of the details of what we're done. We've got the answer, but now what, what is the answer? And so it's a little prettier than you would, it might have been, and also a little uglier than it might have been. You're kind of half lucky and half unlucky. So remember what I said in the case s equals 1, that the proof of the functional equation for eta actually broke up into lots of terms, because eta near a see-through of unity, or eta when you apply you know, a tau plus b over c tau plus d with tau big or small, it splits into c subproducts, but actually c over 2, because you always have to combine l and minus l. And those two form a Jacobi triple problem. You call it 1 minus q to the nx, and it's 1 minus q to the n x inverse, which Jacobi gave as a theta series times some simple eta function. And each of those has a functional equation which is exact. And so actually, you get something much more precise. And the same is true here, except 
all of the forms are uglier, so I'll give them in a somewhat approximate form, but I'll more or less say the truth at the end. So let me define, uh, I'm going to have a function capital lambda, uh, S, but I'll have, in a second, I'll modify it, so I'll first put a zero. This is the first attempt. This will be simply e to the minus the previous Ls. And remember, there was an x, but if you remember, the x was tau to the s over 2 pi i, so if I want to get the tau to be tau, then here I have to take the sth root of 2 pi tau over i. So these are just stupid renormalizations. So essentially here I've done nothing, I've just exponentiate. So exponentiate uh, L, L sub s. Okay, and, and rename the variable very slightly. So this, if I write it out, would be the product mu in z plus alpha, but only the positive numbers, strictly positive numbers in the congruence class z minus alpha, and then it's one minus e of beta, q to the power mu to the power s. Okay, so that's the definition. But now, just as, so if this were the, if S were one, this would be what's called the infinite Pockheimer symbol, uh, x, q, infinity, which is the product from zero to infinity of one minus q to the n, x. And if you think of x as being q to the mu, where mu is, let's say, between zero and one, then that would exactly be q to the n plus mu shifted in that way. So this is like a Pockheimer symbol. It has no modularity at all. But what we know from Jacobi is when s is one, you have to symmetrize. And we know from this also that we have to symmetrize. But remember, when I symmetrized, there was a stupid extra term. If alpha was zero, I had an extra term log of one minus e of beta e to the minus uh, t to the s. But t was zero. And so it's simply uh, one minus e of beta to the power delta alpha zero. So if alpha zero, there's this extra stupid factor. But otherwise, we're going to simply symmetrize. And I think I do this for every s. Certainly, if it's even s, it'll be minus alpha. And maybe I'm just doing still minus alpha, because I haven't, it's, as I said, a little more complicated if s is odd, because then you can't quite apply Poisson there. So remember, it was minus 1 to the s beta, but when, but when s is even, you just symmetrize in alpha. And then if alpha happens to be 0, you have to, because every integer is either positive, negative, or, or 0, you have to include one more factor. So you can see that this will simply be the product over mu in z plus alpha. Uh, again, if, so that's, that's a very nice function. I, I hope I did it. No, I don't quite believe this. No, it seems to even be right. Okay, and now the claim is that this thing will be equal because of the same trace of what I've done there's something that I can't read, which is 1 over tau to the 1 over s, but I can't read that letter in my notes. So I have to look at the tech file again. Oh, I can't even. Oh, I, that's why I couldn't read it. I just put a star because it's some mess and I didn't want to read it in my notes. It's an explicit expression, you know, something elementary over tau to the 1 over s. But then it's a product over all z and h. But now we have two, remember before I had a plus or minus, uh, now I have two signs which are both plus or minus 1. And I'm summing over all z in the upper half plane such that z to the s is minus not 1 over tau but epsilon 1 over tau. And then it's lambda 1. Of course, you can write it all out with four terms, but it's easier to write it as a product. So it's what I told you that basically alpha and beta, here we have alpha and beta in that order, first alpha, then beta, or maybe minus alpha and beta. And here we have first beta and then alpha, but of course, with various sign possibilities. And so. Well, here you see this already symmetric when alpha goes to minus alpha, and here too, because epsilon 2 doesn't occur here. So I could have written this as alpha and minus alpha, okay? So this is the formula, and there's an explicit, you know, computable constant divided by tau to the 1 over s. 
However, that isn't quite the same theta series, of course, because I would say this, the, the higher S is multivar. It can't be multivar Jacobi form just for the reason that eta wasn't, but you still get an exact form that the, each analog to the theta function, which is the, the analog to the triple products, you put together two sums over half lattice, or two products over half lattice, get a product over the full lattice, then this thing does uh, go, and this one, well, this one, you, see, you can't write this in terms of lambda one over S symmetric. Because to symmetrize, it depends whether s is even or odd. But one over s is not even an integer. I mean, we're in, we're in a different world. We symmetrize in some sense respect to roots of unity, which is why you have, indeed, there are a whole bunch of roots of unity here. So, OK, so that's basically with stories. So what I wrote at the end is that in both cases, if s is even or odd, you can write it a little bit uniformly. And then the formula would be that lambda s zero of alpha beta tau times lambda S zero. So the synchronization of is minus one to the alpha minus one to the S beta tau, uh, semicolon tau, will be equal to some elementary factor that one can work out, which in the case when S is even is just a constant over tau to the one over S. Otherwise, there's some more that we had before. But, we, but that part we don't care about because we already know it to all orders from the asymptotics. We only care about the exponentially small part. So this is what we already knew from the previous application. And now it's z in h. And now it's simply z to the s is minus. Oh, no, it's the same. Epsilon 1 and epsilon 2 are plus or minus 1. And it's the same thing exactly. Lambda to the 1 over s 0 of epsilon 1, epsilon 2 to the s beta, comma, semicolon minus epsilon 2 alpha, semicolon z. So it's kind of a bit of a mess. But the basic principle remains true, that this is an exact expression. And you get it from Poisson, whereas before it was asymptotic, and you got it from Euler McLaurin. OK, and so the very last uh, stage, I still have five minutes left. This I could probably even erase, but no, I, this I might as well erase. The one that I shouldn't erase is long ago I wrote the asymptotic form, but that's long gone. But now it'll be the same. It'll be an exact form. And you can still see the asymptotics as the main term. So the final result, so the cor uh, corollary is that theta s, which I haven't even told you the definition. Uh, well, theta s, you can always make a theta s by, as I did here. Uh, well, in fact, I've done it by some elementary things times the product. That will always be an elementary factor times an infinite sum of exponentially small terms. So a very rapidly convergent sum of, of pure exponentials. So now just to do the last two minutes, I'll give the final result. And that I'll only give for, um, so the corollary, so uh, one theorem, that's sort of the main theorem, is that theta s of alpha beta tau is always equal up to an elementary factor. It's a rapidly the convergence, exponentially convergent uh, series of pure exponentials. Bring the combination of pure exponentials in tau to the minus 1 over s. It's, uh, I don't even have to say tau is going to infinity. It converges for every tau in the upper half, and in particular, if tau is very large, then tau to the minus s is, uh, is very small. And you have, uh, sorry, if tau is good either way, whatever it is, it's, it's an infinite sum. So it's a sum, sum c nu, e to the uh, nu, well, lambda, it's some lambda nu times tau to the minus 1 over s. And, and that's an expression. But the formula for that additive would be a terrible mess, just like what we did last time. It's only when you take the log that it's a reasonable formula. And that will make all of the diff difficulties uh, next time on Monday when you apply the circle method that you don't know which terms are going to dominate because you're multiplying a lot of things and that there are combinations. And two of the terms can add up something bigger than some other term. So it becomes a bit of a mess. So this is the abstract theorem. And the explicit theorem is if s is 2, which is the case we care about most, then I'll actually end up and write down the actual formula. And I'll say in words what would happen. So again, cap is a rational number. Uh, Q and the denominator is. Uh, C, I think I don't care about the numerator anymore. 
So then we have, it will be to all the orders. Well, it's exact, sorry, not to all the orders. It's n uh, 2 of c, which maybe you remember is the smallest n, smallest inter n such that its square is 0 mod c. So if c is square free, it's just c. But if c is the square fact, it's a bit smaller, divided by 2 pi t. So t, sorry, okay, I forgot the most important thing. It's e to the minus 1 over t squared, excuse me. So t is going to infinity. Well, t doesn't have to go to infinity. t is just positive because it's exact. But you should think of t as going to infinity. And so we write a point near an arbitrary rational point as e to the 2 pi kappa times e to the minus 1 over t squared. And then I already wrote the formula earlier when I kept the proposition and the corollary. I gave this exact thing to the leading orders. And so I don't really owe you any more the formulas for nt of c, I wrote it to remind you, ct of kappa, or maybe I called it something else, ct tau comma kappa, was a constant which was a combination of a, a zeta function and sim li, but it's the same one it was before. And now we're left with the final sum. It's all l mod c, so that's a finite product, but it's all positive numbers m. Uh, such that m is congruent and uh, all signs. So it's a triple product. C terms, infinitely many terms, and a sign. And that what you want is m is congruent to plus or minus, uh, I think I do need what k is, so cap is a over c. Uh, so it's uh, a l squared modulo c. So we're taking for each m only those l's. So in particular, some m's are not congruent to plus or minus a times the square. They won't contribute. That's what we saw earlier, that you know, quadratic residues and non-quadratic residues are different things. And then the final term is 1 minus e to the 2 pi i of l over c times e to the minus e of plus or minus 1 over 8. So you have the two roots of i, I'm sorry, e to the 2 pi times plus or minus 1. And then there's the term 2 pi c to the 3 halves. And then there's this term squared of m. And then there's the term t. And so that's the final theorem when s is 1. And then I can take another half a minute to say what you have to do if s is not 1. So if s is uh, bigger than 2, it's similar, but uh, just as we said at the absolute product term, there's an extra term. There's an extra term, which is e to the 2 pi times the generalized Dedekind sum, which I defined by 4. But remember that Dedekind sum, you probably don't remember, but it was L over C and uh, AL to the S over C. But if S is even, then this is even, and that's odd, and it's 0. So you didn't see it for S equals 2, but I did write it for general S. So that's why in this formula, there is no Dedekind sum. So I don't know what I'm saying. I was going to write in red and put errors, but there's no real point. So the first part is there's an extra e. There's also and an extra term e to the 1 half, zeta of minus s times t. That's the one you very much see for the dedicate data function, because zeta of minus 1 is minus of 12. But zeta of minus 2 is 0. So in this particular form, you don't see. But if I did general, uh, of course, you have n s of c instead of n 2 of c. That's clear. You have 2 pi over c to the power 1 plus 1 over s. So here, well, since it's 2 pi over c, this was obviously a, a mystery, it's 2 pi over c. The three halves will become 2 pi c to the 1 plus 1 over s. The congruence condition will be, of course, that m is congruent to plus or minus uh, a l to the s. Well, to the c, all of that you could guess. And the last thing is that e to the plus or minus 1 over 8 is replaced by appropriate choices of four s roots of unity. So here, s was two, so it was an eighth root of unity. And there, and there are primitive s roots. I don't remember the exact formula, and it's complicated. But essentially, there's a formula very much of the same sort, where you're taking all you know, four s roots of unity. And then if you unwind that for the eta function, this is, uh, and this is essentially eta, remember. It tells you the exact transformation law. So I'm sorry, today had a lot of very, very nitty-gritty formulas, 
But the point was never to give equal uniformness. The point is you can get them, and they're simple enough that one can write them down. One doesn't necessarily want to read them. But that formula, which started out asymptotic, because it came from Euler McLaurin, it was the sum over half lattices. After you symmetrize, it becomes the sum over whole lattices. Then it gets both simpler and more complicated. It's simpler because the two half lattices give you a whole lattice. You can apply Poisson. The entire asymptotic thing collapses. Only a few terms in the beginning survive, and it terminates. But to make up for it, that's only the leading term. Now you have all the rest of Poisson. You have all the other Fourier transforms. And they have to be computed, and that's quite a lot of work. And that gives these dual things where the tau has become 1 over the s root of tau, roughly. So uh, I'm not sure what this, uh, I guess it's the same t, which I moved. But anyway, the, again, the details don't matter. But roughly, you, you're going from a number x to its minus uh, 1 over s to the powers. But of course, uh, since 1 over s is not an integer, there are many with roots of unity. But, but in the end, you get an exact formula, because you can use Poisson. So, OK, so that was the unpleasant part of this whole calculation, which is seeing what you actually get when you don't just do asymptotics, but do it on the node. But the next time, which that should be fun again, uh, how does this you know, work when you actually want the coefficients, but you want to write them as a sum of squares or cubes or whatever? So I'll, I managed to go over time, even though I was under time before. So I'll stop. If there are any questions, quick questions, you can ask otherwise, maybe. Everyone? Well, how can you not have a question? <laughs> OK. If no one wants to ask you a question, I'm still here. People who are here can ask me uh, privately. And anybody can ask next time by Zoom or, of course, by email. And I'll try to answer to the extent that I know. OK. So then we'll see you on Monday. And as I say, Monday, I'll finish this story. And then Wednesday, either I've run out of gas, if I can't find any of my notes, I'll try to tell something, or I'll have something fun to say about this all the conversion series. Okay.